So I wanted to make a video series in order to offer hopefully charitable critique to some of the things that were brought up on the YouTube channel, The Logos Project, concerning the SSPX and various issues connected to them. I've already commented on a few videos by The Logos Project and Dom, the host, politely engaged with my comments and also offered me to come on his show, but I instead decided to make standalone videos, which I think could serve the cause better and Dom was also happy about this decision. I hope he will watch these videos and there can be some good fruits coming out of this. So I'll divide this video series into three parts. In the first video, I will begin by basically reiterating my initial comments, which were mainly critiquing the argumentation technique that Mr. Salsa is engaging in, namely either misquoting or quoting out of context Archbishop Lefebvre, and by doing so, changing the meaning of the statements. This is in reference to the video titled the errors of Archbishop Lefebvre. I will then focus on the doctrine of collegiality and the nature of the episcopacy and why Mr. Salsa is, in my opinion, misrepresenting the whole issue in order to be able to accuse Lefebvre of heresy and or a false ecclesiology. Also, I will put links to every resource I used in the description. In the second video, I will go on to address the issue of fulfilling one's Sunday obligation at the SSPX also going through the comments I made on this video released by the Logos Project not long ago, and how Mr. Salsa is, in my opinion, guilty of the same thing he's accusing the SSPX of, namely cherry-picking statements made by the church when it comes to this question. In the third part, I will go into the question of schism in general and will present my own arguments while also trying to lay out the different positions that are generally taken by Catholics who know about it when it comes to this issue SSPX in schism or not, and how Mr. Salsa is really embracing the most extreme position possible, which is, in my opinion, untenable. In the end, I will also address Father James Maudsley, because Mr. Bartell, who is also a frequent guest on the Logos Project, mentioned him at the end of the video titled The Errors of Archbishop Lefebvre, and in my opinion, completely misrepresented this great priest. So let's start with the first part. Now to give the context, in the video titled the errors of Archbishop Lefebvre, Mr. Salsa is trying to accuse Lefebvre of heresy by quoting a letter of the Archbishop, which supposedly proves that Lefebvre thinks that jurisdiction comes from the people, which is condemned by Pius X himself in his catechism, as Mr. Salsa notes correctly. Now, here we come to one of my biggest concerns, namely the way Mr. Salsa is evidently heavily misquoting Lefebvre, and therefore misrepresenting his position. I find this very troublesome and also unnecessary because if Mr. Salsa feels so convinced of his position, he shouldn't need to engage in these illegitimate argumentation tactics. I mean, we wouldn't even do this to someone like Martin Luther when we are rightfully condemning his positions. I'll try my best when I uh, represent Mr. Salsa's position and if I misrepresent him, please do correct me. In the video, Mr. Salsa quotes from a letter that was written in 1991 by Lefebvre shortly before his death, in which he is addressing the issue of the succession of Bishop Castromaya, who was the additional bishop who was present at the consecrations in 1988. The context of this letter is very specific, and Lefebvre is contemplating on how it could be possible for a newly consecrated bishop to attain jurisdiction without receiving it ordinarily from the Pope. I will also put a link of the whole letter in the description so you can read the whole text for yourself. So here, very importantly, Mr. Salsa wants to prove that Lefebvre subscribes to the heretical belief of jurisdiction comes from the people. And in order to do that, he quotes a few passages from the letter, and I will now read two of them and parallel them with the actual or full quotes of the letter. At roughly the 59 minutes mark, he quotes the archbishop thus. Quote, there is no other basis for jurisdiction than that which comes from the request of the priests and the faithful to take care of their souls. End quote. Obviously, if you hear this, you are led to believe that Lefebvre is making a general statement about the nature of jurisdiction as such. But here is the real slash full quote from the letter. Quote, this is not the case with the new bishop who has no other basis for jurisdiction than that which comes from the request of the priests and the faithful to take care of their souls and those of their children, and who have asked him to accept the episcopacy 
so as to give them true Catholic priests and the grace of the sacrament of confirmation. End quote. So here we can see the misquoting very clearly, I think. Mr. Salsa conveniently slips in the word there in his quoting at the beginning, and additionally, he leaves out the first part, which shows that Lefebvre is actually talking specifically about one bishop and is not making a general claim about the nature of ordinary jurisdiction itself. When you listen to Mr. Salsa, though, it surely seems as if Lefebvre was making a general statement about jurisdiction. But the full quote shows that he's not doing this at all. And remember that Mr. Salsa wants to prove heresy here. For the average listener, one is led to believe that Lefebvre talks about jurisdiction as such, which is not the case. He's clearly talking about how jurisdiction could work in this particular case, meaning he's basically making an argument for supplied jurisdiction. So here's the second quote from Mr. Salsa, where he quotes the letter, quote, The jurisdictional authority of the bishop does not come from a Roman nomination, but from the necessity of the salvation of souls, and they must consequently facilitate the exercise of his authority by generous obedience, end quote. This, in my opinion, is one of the most obvious misquotations because it leaves out and meshes two different passages of the letter together, which actually belong to two different sentences. Mr. Salsa also omits the first word, which is important because remember that Lefebvre is talking about one specific bishop. So here's the full quote. Quote, Since the jurisdictional authority of the bishop does not come from a Roman nomination, but from the necessity of the salvation of souls, he will have to exercise it with a special delicacy and taking special account for his presbyterial council. Again, he's addressing the case of this specific bishop, and Mr. Salsa makes it out to be a general statement about the nature of jurisdiction as such. He also conveniently leaves out the caveat from the archbishop, which would have obviously weakened his accusation of Lefebvre being a heretic, and he slides in the end of another sentence, mixing two different sentences together. The second part of Mr. Salsa's quote is actually from another sentence, which goes this way, quote, Moreover, the faithful and priests must acknowledge the grace of having a pastor, successor of the apostles, and guardian of tradition, of the deposit of faith, of the Eucharistic sacrifice of the Catholic priesthood, and of the grace of the sacraments, and they must consequently facilitate the exercise of his authority by a generous obedience. Now let's look at this full quote again from before, where Mr. Salsa left out the first word. Since the jurisdictional authority of the bishop, namely the specific bishop in Brazil, does not come from a Roman nomination, but from the necessity of the salvation of souls, etc. This is actually pretty funny because when we look at this quote within its full context, this one sentence alone is already debunking Mr. Salsa's claim. Because now, with the proper context in mind, we can clearly see that Lefebvre is presupposing something here. What is this rule or this presupposition that Lefebvre has? Where does jurisdictional authority normally come from? Obviously, from a Roman nomination. This is the rule that Lefebvre obviously believes. Otherwise, he wouldn't need to make a case for an exception regarding this specific bishop. And this is actually proven by exactly the sentence Mr. Salsa wants to use to prove that Lefebvre believes the jurisdiction comes from the people in principle, which is Mr. Salsa's claim. If Lefebvre actually believed this, then his letter would have been just one short sentence, like, don't worry guys, jurisdiction comes from the people, no problem at all here. But this is not what he's saying. Obviously, he doesn't believe that in principle jurisdiction comes from the people. What we have to ask, and what Lefebvre is contemplating, is, is there a way of attaining jurisdiction, i.e. permission, where it doesn't come from a Roman nomination? Yes, in principle, there is. It is called Ecclesia Suprat, and in that case, it is the church that supplies the jurisdiction. Now, there are obviously specific circumstances to be met for supplied jurisdiction to be able to be exercised, but is it a heresy to contemplate and or believe that it exists and that it might work? No, obviously not, quite the contrary. And there is really logically nothing wrong in saying that it is the request of the faithful needing to save their souls which can act as the basis of this supplied jurisdiction. When a faithful is, for example, in danger of death, the church supplies jurisdiction, i.e. permission, to a even, for example, excommunicated priest who thus gets permission to perform the needed sacraments. 
The church gives this permission, i.e. jurisdiction. But what is the basis of her granting it? Obviously, the request of the dying faithful. Now please tell me where it is logically wrong to say that. Actually, you really have to think that Lefebvre was stupid to believe in a position that was condemned by Pius X. So basically Catholicism 101. The same Lefebvre who was formed by one of the best Catholic seminaries at his time and who was very much promoted by Pius XII. This is obviously a ridiculous accusation. The funny thing is that Mr. Sasa also cannot explain how this could be in any way consistent within Lefebvre's mind. So he's just saying that Lefebvre is inconsistent, confused, or even a hypocrite. But maybe, Mr. Sasa, you are wrong here. I challenge you to look at all these full quotes within their context, without your anti-SSPX bias, and then tell me that you still come to your conclusion that Lefebvre believed the jurisdiction as such comes from the people, without engaging in weird mental gymnastics or simple accusations like calling Lefebvre a hypocrite, which is always an easy way out. Another quote that Mr. Sasa brings up is from the biography of Lefebvre, written by Bernard Tissier de Malaré, who was one of the bishops who was consecrated by Lefebvre, where he quotes from the book Lefebvre saying, quote, the people give you jurisdiction, end quote. I will read to you now the full paragraph to put the quote into context. I only have a copy in German, so I translated it. This is from page 555 of the biography of Archbishop Lefebvre, written by Bernard Tissier, quote, the spiritual needs of the faithful always remain the supreme law that justifies the apostolate of the priests of the fraternity in times of crisis, both their establishment in a particular place and their jurisdiction over persons. The jurisdiction of priests in these exceptional circumstances is not delegated by the diocesan bishop, nor is it local. Rather, it is exercised over persons in need of it on a case-by-case -case basis according to an intervention provided by canon law, whether according to the particular norms, canon 882, 1098, etc., whether according to the general rules, canon 209, or whether according to the, quote, supreme law, namely the salvation of souls, end quote. In this sense, the archbishop said to his priests, quote, the faithful confer jurisdiction on you. Of course, we must understand these words cum granos artis, that is, not literally. Monsignor Lefebvre was fond of invoking the, quote, spiritual mortal danger of souls suffocated by the lack and grace and in extraordinary circumstances, end quote, to refer to the, quote, generosity of the church, end quote, in these substitute provisions, end quote. I think this makes it very clear that Lefebvre is again reflecting upon the possibility of ecclesia supplet, that is, supplied jurisdiction and not defending the proposition that jurisdiction comes from the people, as Mr. Salsa wants us to believe, but maybe he also misunderstands the archbishop. And remember that as soon as one is making the argument that these canons, which I quoted from the book, do actually not apply, one would concede my point, because then one would try to refute the claim for supplied jurisdiction and automatically would cease to claim that Lefebvre believes in the proposition that jurisdiction comes from the people. Because again, here Mr. Salsa is accusing Lefebvre of a heresy, and that is on a whole other level. So I think this pattern of misquotation clearly shows that there is something wrong with Mr. Salsa's argumentation. Or is it just me who thinks that the full quotes uh, change the meaning substantially and do not anymore support Mr. Salsa's accusations? Please do correct me if you think that my reasoning here is flawed, but I really cannot see how this can be a legitimate argumentation. Because again, Mr. Salsa is trying to accuse Lefebvre of heresy, so the bar is pretty high. If he quoted him correctly, I think it would not be possible at all to accuse Lefebvre of heresy. You could only make a case for error on Lefebvre's part by claiming that he applies supplied jurisdiction wrongly, but not heresy. And this is also not nitpicking on my behalf, because there is a huge difference between error and heresy. So after seeing these real quotes, I think we can throw out the accusation of heresy entirely. In fact, I think it's strange that Mr. Salsa is raising the bar in such a way because many times he also argues against supplied jurisdiction, or rather how the SSPX interprets it. So he could have done just the same with this letter, but no, he apparently absolutely wants to make a heretic out of Lefebvre. 
which is a position which actually very few people hold. And it is, in fact, in my opinion, untenable. At least these arguments by Mr. Sasa don't support this claim at all. Rather, when looking at the full quotes, they are immediately and easily refuted. One has to do the work, however, which is indeed time consuming. But I think it is worth it and also necessary to point out these misquotations by Mr. Sasa. It seems to me that a fair reading of this letter and of the real quotes naturally leads one to the opinion that Lefebvre is making a point for supplied jurisdiction. Now we can argue if he has a valid argument for that. And I'm sure that Dom from the Logos Project and Mr. Salsa would certainly disagree. But what we simply cannot say is that it is heretical to simply argue for supplied jurisdiction. Now, I won't go into the topic of supplied jurisdiction itself in this video, because there is another thing I want to talk about. And as I said, to prove my point here, I don't actually have to argue or defend Lefebvre's assessment regarding this particular case. I only have to prove that he is certainly not making heretical statements, what Mr. Salsa is accusing him of. I think this is pretty clear now, because one who simply argues for supplied jurisdiction is not a heretic. He may be erring, but that is obviously very different. So let's move on to the next topic, collegiality. Because the question of jurisdiction somewhat leads me to this next point, namely collegiality, or rather the nature of the episcopacy, which is also closely linked to jurisdiction. Here again, I want to critique Mr. Salsa's presentation of Lefebvre's position. I will try to show that Mr. Salsa actually relies on faulty premises and that his assertion that Lefebvre practically or basically made up his own ecclesiology in order to justify his actions is wrong. Here I refer to a few quotes from another video by the Logos Project titled Questions for Bishop Schneider on the SSPX, where at the end Dom and John Salsa investigate the justification for the consecration of 1988 by Lefebvre, who later used Bishop Eusebius as a historical example, which in his opinion was an example that was similar to his. This bishop, Bishop Eusebius, ordained priests and even consecrated bishops in a territory that had no bishop and where Eusebius himself had no jurisdiction. Mr. Salsa says, and this is of course not only his opinion, that Eusebius was able to do that without having jurisdiction over these territories because he had, quote, universal jurisdiction by virtue of being a member of the college, member of the episcopacy in hierarchical communion with the Holy Father. Here, he refers to the doctrine of collegiality, which we will talk about in a moment. And I'm actually not going to talk about the specific case of Eusebius. I just wanted to use this as a segue to discuss collegiality and how Mr. Salsa portrays the position of Lefebvre and the SSPX. He seems to present Lefebvre's position as being out of line and not in accordance with perennial church teaching. Mr. Salsa also says that, quote, the society doesn't understand how a bishop could have universal jurisdiction that is antecedent to any territorial jurisdiction, end quote. And that, quote, they deny that the bishops collectively share in the Pope's supreme and universal jurisdiction, but this is a perennial doctrine of the church, end quote. The problem here is that Mr. Salsa is portraying the doctrine of collegiality and with it the nature of the episcopacy as if it were 100% clear. Here I'm also referring to the article written by John Salsa titled Exposing the SSPX's Errors on Collegiality on his website True or False Pope, which I will also link in the description, where he mentions that the council's teaching on collegiality is completely traditional and also that the SSPX's errors and in extensions, I guess, the errors of Archbishop Lefebvre are super obvious. And maybe if someone objects to my presentation by using arguments from this article, I can go more into it in future videos. Because here I'm mostly trying to show that there are simply different positions when it comes to collegiality and the episcopate, a traditional one and a novel one or a position that was held by the large minority of theologians. And although criticism will shine through, it is not so much about saying which position is the correct one. The main point is to show that the position taken by Lefebvre and the SSPX is not unreasonable or novel or pseudo-traditional. 
In my coming arguments, I will try to show that Mr. Salsa is wrong. When he accuses Lefebvre of having a false, or at least invented, non-traditional ecclesiology in that regard, when in fact it is Lefebvre's view that was the one that was considered traditional. And I will show that it was not only Lefebvre who had a profound critique regarding the teaching of collegiality, which was implemented at the Second Vatican Council in the document Lumen Gentium, Chapter 3. My critique here is not so much about whether collegiality itself is problematic, as the SSPX holds, but I want to show that when it comes to the question of the episcopacy, it is not the case that collegiality, according to Lumen Gentium, was the perennial teaching of the church, as Mr. Salsa claims, and that the arguments made against collegiality are, in my opinion, legitimate and reasonable. So let's look into the topic itself. What is collegiality? Collegiality is the idea that there is not one subject of the supreme power in the church, the pope, but two subjects, namely the pope and the college of the bishops, together with the pope. In order to be able to come to that conclusion, one has to examine the nature of episcopacy itself, which I will try to do here. If the first Vatican Council had a mark, it would be papal primacy or supremacy. For the second Vatican Council, on the other hand, I'd say this mark would be collegiality, and with it, the questions regarding the nature of the episcopacy and the Episcopal College. The term collegiality is actually a new term that was created by the theologian Yves Congar in the 20th century, who got it from the Russian by translating the Russian term sobornost as collegiality. For many bishops and theologians, the proposed doctrine of collegiality was the centerpiece of the whole Second Vatican Council. Hans Küng said that the vote on the implementation of this doctrine was considered as the, quote, peaceful October revolution of the Catholic Church, end quote. Cardinal Suenens, an important figure at the council, said, quote, October the 30th is a crucial date in the history of the church. The battle of the 12th is won, end quote. I will now try to give a short overview on the nature of episcopacy, and please note that I'm not an ecclesiologist, so this is based upon my own research. And as I said, I will link all my resources in the descriptions. But if you see any fundamental flaws, please do correct me. Generally, one can describe the bishop as having three distinct abilities or powers. Firstly, the sacramental power, power of order, also called potestas ordinis in Latin, which enables him to ordain priests, consecrate bishops, etc. Secondly, the power to rule or govern, also called potestas jurisdictionis, and thirdly, the power to teach, sanctifying, governing, and teaching. When does a bishop obtain these qualities, and by whom are they granted, or where do they come from? The power of order, potestas ordinis, is given to the priest when he is consecrated a bishop, by divine right from God. This is very clear and has always been believed by the church. Now, when it comes to the power of ruling, potestas jurisdictionis, it gets more complicated. The Second Vatican Council, or in particular Lumen Gentium, the document on the church, actually introduced a different, some would say novel concept, because in its terminology, it didn't use the term power or the classical potestas in relationship to the powers or abilities the bishop has or obtains, but to refer to it as office, which in Latin is munus. So for example, the potestas ordinis, the power of order, is called in Lumen Gentium munus of sanctifying. Now, munus in the English document is translated as office, but in a strict sacramental ontological sense, munus means gift that allows service. So it can be seen as sacramental. And what it does, it actually scales down the juridical aspects of the mission of the church, as Roberto de Mattei, the church historian, puts it. So the following questions are, when do bishops obtain jurisdiction and what kind of jurisdiction is it? Is it universal or territorial? Here in this video, I will not address the questions on territorial jurisdiction, but will only focus on the question of universal jurisdiction. The document Lumen Gentium says that bishops, by virtue of their consecration, become a member of the College of Bishops 
and if they are in hierarchical communion with the Pope, participate in the munus, which again means office or gift that allows service, of the Pope. So they participate in his supreme authority, also meaning they participate in his universal jurisdiction. So this means bishops obtain a kind of universal jurisdiction at their episcopal consecration. Here is Lumencentium article 22, quote, one is constituted a member of the episcopal body in virtue of sacramental consecration and hierarchical communion with the head and members of the body, end quote. They participate in the supreme authority of the Pope not only during an ecumenical council, which is something that was always believed by the church, but also when they are dispersed throughout the world. Again, Lumencentium article 22, quote, This same collegiate power can be exercised together with the Pope by the bishops living in all parts of the world, provided that the head of the college calls them to collegiate action, or at least approves of or freely accepts the united action of the scattered bishops, so that it is thereby made a collegiate act. And lastly, they participate in this authority by divine right, because Lumencentium Article 21 states, Quote, but episcopal consecration, together with the office of sanctifying, also confers the office of teaching and of governing, which, however, of its very nature, can be exercised only in hierarchical communion with the head and the member of the college. End quote. So, in this view, the governing power is seen as something sacramental rather than administrative, merely delegated by the Pope. Lumencentium, again, doesn't use the traditional terms, which were the Latin terms potestas ordinis, power of order, and potestas jurisdictionis, power to rule, but stick to the term munus, or office. The munus, office, of governing or ruling, enters into a bishop's being, and the Pope can allow them to exercise it or not. This ability can also obviously not be lost. So we have two concepts of power expressed through different terms. There is munus, which is translated as office, but in a strictly sacramental ontological sense, as I already mentioned, means gift that allows service. And there is potestas ordinis, the power of order, and potestas jurisdictionis, the power to govern. The latter two are the traditional terms used by the Catholic Church when she talked about sacramental and juridical power. Lumencentium avoids these terms consciously, for reasons I probably won't go into, I think it has to do with the intent to emphasize auctoritas over protestas, also in order to trying to heal the schism with the East, which, in my opinion, would be a misguided approach to the problem. But back to Lumencentium. So Lumencentium strictly uses the word munus, or office, when it comes to the three abilities of a bishop. I already mentioned that munus can have different meanings. What does munus mean in the context of Lumen Gentium. Roberto de Mattei, the church historian, put it this way, quote, Vatican II did not explicitly reject the traditional concept of power, potestas. They set it aside, replacing it with an equivocal new concept, that of munus. Article 21 of Lumen Gentium then seems to teach that episcopal consecration confers not only the fullness of orders, but also the office of teaching and the office of governing. Whereas in the whole history of the church, the act of episcopal consecration has been distinguished from that of appointment or of the conferral of the canonical mission. This ambiguity is consistent with the ecclesiology of the theologians of the council and post-council, Congar, Ratzinger, Dulibac, Balthasar, Rana, Schillebeck who presumed to reduce the mission of the church to a sacramental function, scaling down its juridical aspects. And here is another quote from de Mattei, quote, Today, we tend to divinize, to absolutize what is human in the church, ecclesiastical persons, and instead to humanize, to relativize what is divine in the church, its faith, its sacraments, its tradition. This error gives rise to grave consequences also on the psychological and spiritual level, end quote. 
So to summarize this position on the episcopacy, the munus office of governing, which could mean the power to govern as a kind of universal jurisdiction directly enters the priest when he's consecrated a bishop and is given to him by God, so by divine right, and can therefore not be lost. He can, however, only exercise it in hierarchical communion with the Pope and the other members of the college. So this brings us to the other position, because there is actually one, and it is not made up by the Favre. The traditional doctrine is that the power of the Pope is the only highest power in the Church, and only he has the fullness of jurisdiction, meaning that bishops do not receive any universal jurisdiction at their episcopal consecration, but can get it only through the Pope, not immediately from Christ. And again, this is not made up by Lefebvre. It is rather the position which was traditionally held by the majority of theologians. To support that claim, I will actually let someone else speak, and I will quote a critique from a note sent to the Pope during the drafting of Lumen Gentium at the Second Vatican Council by the Coetus Internationalis Patrum, a group of Catholic bishops, cardinals, and priests that formed itself during the Second Vatican Council and where Lefebvre was part of, who defended the traditional positions. This note is concerned with the topic of collegiality, episcopate consecration, and jurisdiction. If you want to get further into this whole topic, I recommend reading the book The Second Vatican Council by Roberto de Mattei. This would actually be my honest recommendation for both Mr. Salsa and especially Dom, if they haven't read it yet, because it gives a comprehensive and historical account of the Second Vatican Council as a council and also as an event from a sound Catholic perspective. I think it would really challenge some of their views in a profound and good way. So this is from the note addressed to the Holy Father on the schema Constitutionis de Ecclesia from Cardinal Arcadio Maria Laraona, which was signed by many cardinals and superiors of religious congregations, for example, the Superior General of the Dominican Order. Quote, in our opinion, the doctrine set forth and contained in the schema as a whole and in particular in the points enumerated above, among which is the Episcopal consecration and collegiality, is a new doctrine, which until 1958, or rather 1962, represented only the opinions of a few theologians. Even those opinions were less common and less probable. It was the contrary doctrine, which even recently was common and encouraged by the Church's magisterium. The common doctrine, accepted in the Church as sound and more probable, until 1962, was at the root of constitutional discipline and also concerned the essential validity of acts, and this as much in the sphere of the councils, whether ecumenical, plenary, or provincial, as in that of government, at all stages, pontifical, regional, provincial, missionary, etc. End quote. Now, reading from another part of the note, quote, Finally, if we consider the gravity of the questions dealt with, and solved in the schema, we must weigh their consequences from the hierarchical point of view. Consider thus, it may well be said, the schema changes the face of the church. Firstly, from being monarchical, the church becomes Episcopalian and collegiate, and this by divine right and by virtue of the Episcopal consecration. Secondly, the primacy is injured and emptied of its content, because not being based on a sacrament, as the bishop's power is, people logically tend to consider all bishops as equal by virtue of a common sacrament, and this leads them to believe and state that the bishop of Rome is no more than a primus inter pares. Thirdly, discipline, and with it conciliar and pontifical doctrine are injured by the confusion between the power of order and the power of jurisdiction. In short, the schema injures the system of ecumenical councils, of the other councils, of pontifical as well as provincial and diocesan government, of the administration of the missions. It injures the rules concerning the functioning of the power of order, always valid, even if it is illicit, and of the power of jurisdiction, which can be invalid, even if one has the order conferring the essential power concerned. Finally, all this injury is because the distinction between the powers has not been respected, and because account has not been taken of what issues surely and objectively, from the power of jurisdiction. Fourthly, 
The hierarchy of jurisdiction is distinct from that of order, which the text declares again and again to be of divine right, is shaken and destroyed. In fact, if it be admitted that episcopal consecration, being a sacrament of order, brings with it not only the power of order, as the ordination of the priest and deacon bestows them on its own degree, but also expressly and by divine right, all the powers of jurisdiction, of magisterium and of government, not only in the bishop's particular church, but also in the universal church, it is clear that the objective distinction between the power of order and that of jurisdiction becomes artificial, at the mercy of a whim and terribly insecure. The distinction between power and hierarchy of order or of jurisdiction is objectively shaken even if one tries to set up bulwarks, pretty futile however, to save the appearances of the primacy." End quote. Another critique came from Monsignor Franick, who spoke before the bishops at the Second Vatican Council in the Basilica. He said that it is a doctrinal error that bishops obtain their episcopal jurisdiction by divine right, and not as traditionally believed, immediately from the Pope and only immediately from Christ. An additional thing I want to add here, which is very significant. At the Second Vatican Council, during the discussions on the document Lumen Gentium, Paul VI eventually did intervene and added an explanatory note to the document Lumen Gentium regarding collegiality, which gives to it an authoritative interpretation, the famous Nota Explicativa Previa. This was by and large regarded as a victory for the traditional slash conservative front and as a defeat for the progressive party at the council. I will link to the document Lumen Gentium in the description and there at the end of the text you can read the Nota Previa for yourself. It was the attempt to uphold the plenary power of the Pope and don't let collegiality be understood in opposition to the Pope's power. And I do say attempt because De Mattei notes in his book The Second Vatican Council that the conservative Cardinal Ruffini, while being very happy and relieved by this note from Paul VI, was also warning against the threat of many who will try to attenuate its authoritative character. In the end, however, Lumen Gentium, which contained the doctrine of collegiality, was voted for by a large majority of bishops. But this does not mean that all is settled, because before it came to this vote at the Second Vatican Council, it was made known to all bishops that the theological quality of Lumen Gentium is to be regarded as pastoral and not doctrinal, and that the teachings of the Council do not have to be regarded as dogmas or infallible definitions. Now I know that this in itself is a whole other debate, and I know that this does also not mean that one can just disregard everything that was taught at the Second Vatican Council just like that. But when such a pronouncement is made just before a vote for the document itself, I think one can naturally come to the conclusion that what is voted on is not binding in a dogmatic sense and therefore could maybe still be debated if properly argued and with good reason. So to break it down again, we can distinguish between two views when it comes to the nature of episcopacy. In the first view, the bishop at his consecration also receives, besides the fullness of the power of order, the munus of teaching and the munus of governing immediately from God. This munus of governing is meant to be universal, not territorial. Munus can be translated as office or gift, and according to De Mattei, is an equivocal replacement for potestas, power. The bishops, however, can only exercise it within hierarchical communion with the Pope and the other bishops. This munus cannot be lost. According to the other view, the Pope is the sole possessor of the plenary juridical power which he received from God, and the bishops only share in his universal jurisdiction at an ecumenical council, and only because the Pope grants it to them during this period of time. So it's only the Pope who can grant him this universal jurisdiction. And the bishop does not receive it by divine right at his episcopal consecration and does not possess it all the time, but only during an ecumenical council when the pope grants it. The distinctions between the powers, potestas ordinis and potestas jurisdictionis, is clear and meaningful. Now, so what does this say to us? Why did I try to talk so long about these rather complicated questions on ecclesiology? Because Mr. Salsa seems to claim that Lefebvre has a non-traditional or invented view on the episcopacy, which would also mean he has a wrong ecclesiology. But now it is clear that this is not the case, 
and that this claim by Mr. Salsa is wrong. And I think I have proved that. One sees, after really investigating this issue, that there have been, and maybe still are, clearly two views on the nature of episcopacy, which also means in extension that there are maybe two different views on ecclesiology. Mr. Salsa, however, acts as if Lefebvre just kind of made up his position on the episcopacy, and that there were no justified questions or debate at all about the concept of collegiality. This gives the impression that Lefebvre was completely alone and isolated with his position. At least that was the impression I got when I listened to Mr. Salsa about the position of Lefebvre. Am I the only one who got this impression? Please do share the impressions you got in the comments below from listening to Mr. Salsa and also if my presentations here maybe changed your view. But this representation by Mr. Salsa is, as I think I have shown now, actually not accurate at all. And this is also my main problem in many ways with his general argumentation. He acts as if these things were abundantly clear, whether it comes to a supposed heresy of Lefebvre, the doctrine of collegiality, schism, or Sunday obligation, which I will deal with in my next videos, when they really aren't. And if you study the issue closely, you really cannot make the arguments Mr. Salsa makes anymore. So to conclude my overall critique here, Mr. Salsa acts as if Lefebvre was the only one having a different position when it comes to the ecclesiology of the episcopacy, which touches jurisdiction. And he seems to claim that the doctrine of collegiality, according to Lumen Gentium, was or is not novel at all, but has always been the church's teaching. He also gives the impression that Lefebvre just fostered his own ecclesiology in order to justify his actions. This is far from being true, because there were, as I showed, in fact, two opposing views, and Lefebvre simply held one of them, which was also considered the traditional one and held by the majority of theologians up until the 1950s. So Mr. Salsa's claims here are really misleading, because again, one gets the impression that Lefebvre was just this weird pseudo-traditionalist who had a false ecclesiology. Only this would mean that also Cardinal Laraona, Monsignor Franick, the superior general of the Dominicans and the Jesuits back then, Cardinal Staffa, and also Cardinal Ottaviani, and many more would just have been weird pseudo-traditionalists who had a false ecclesiology, because they held the same position as Lefebvre did. So now to conclude the whole video and my overall argumentation. In the first part, I showed that Mr. Salsa is misquoting Lefebvre in order to falsely accuse him of holding the heretical proposition of jurisdiction comes from the people. In the second part, I argued that Mr. Salsa, when discussing collegiality, misrepresented Lefebvre's position and extension via SSPX's view on the episcopate in order to accuse Lefebvre of a false ecclesiology trying to turn him basically into a pseudo-traditionalist. Maybe my presentation here in the second part concerning collegiality and the episcopate can also be viewed as a general attempt to justify the position of the SSPX and anyone who holds a similar position when it comes to this doctrine. I just wanted to mention also that it was quite a lot of research that went into this video, especially the second part, and the topic is really, really dense, and I hope I was able to present it in a somewhat comprehensible manner. Uh, feedback or further questions would be very much appreciated here. The next video about Sunday obligation will come soon, hopefully, and also will much likely be shorter, I think. So hopefully I was able to give a overall reasonable and charitable critique here, and maybe a fruitful dialogue will also come out of this. Please share all your thoughts, uh, questions, and or objections in the comments below. Thank you for listening. Jesus is King.